Good Friday morning. This text by Wisdom is just, I tell you the truth, is what I was just saying. What? This is a famous text, by the way. Uh, the wisdom literature is all over the place as far as being quoted heavily. It's brilliant. That's why it's incredibly brilliant, okay? But in, in it, there's this element today that's used philosophically all over the place. I'll show it to you. It said, all men were by nature foolish who were in ignorance of God and who from the good things seen did not succeed in knowing him who is and from and from him who is and from studying the works did not discern the artisans. A famous line. That's famous inference to the existence of God. From the works, from the beauty and orderliness of life in the world, et cetera, et cetera, when infers to the quality of the, of the maker. That's Paley's argument in the 17th century. The, the universe, he saw it as a perfectly working machine, a clock, where you infer from the clock, the clockmaker, the clockmaker. See, that's the, he's, he took it from the Book of Wisdom. But it is a thing. You look at the product and you infer the nature and the intelligence of the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the maker. See? You, we automatically do that. And think human product, we certainly do. And art, you can see into the mind of the artist, the quality of the artist, by looking at the quality of the art. See? It's a famous inference from the clock to the clockmaker from the orderliness of the world to the orderliness of the mind that created the world. Because if there's orderliness, you have to account for its orderliness. It can't give it to itself. Hence, it had to come from an ordered mind, a mind capable. Every effect has a proportionate cause, okay? All right, it has to be a sufficiently proportionate cause or you can't explain it. This is what he's getting at, see? All right? See, but the mistake is when you fail to see the artisan and you only see the art. Now watch what he says. But either fire or wind or swift air or the circuit of the stars or the mighty water or the luminaries of heaven, the governance of the world, they consider God. So you start to mistake the thing for the thing maker. <laughs> you see, it's, you, you lose sight. You can't get past the effect. And you, refer, you either refuse or you're not inclined. I want to be kind here to not to seek the cause. You're satisfied with the effect. And you choose not to seek by inference the cause. See? Now, if out of... See, that's the interesting. I see that in the sciences, which I, I respect it. There's no reason to go beyond the scientific method for what you want. But that doesn't produce a wisdom. It just produces knowledge. Knowledge of what? Whatever you're studying. But that's not a wisdom. Because wisdom is comprehensive. Sciences are not comprehensive. They're limited by the scientific method. Unless you claim that's the only kind of knowledge there is. And if that's the case, you've done horrible violence to all forms of knowledge other than that. You tell me there's not truth in art? Don't give me that. Don't tell me that. You're going to reduce everything to biology and chemistry and genetics? And you're going to lose the whole idea of adventure that only the poet and the artist reveals, the storyteller. Huh? Come on. Are you wiser than that native grandfather who's sitting in his teepee who's telling his grandsons and granddaughters the great story of their migration? Or the Jews writing in the, in the scriptures? Is that reducible down to science? Or mere history? It's storytelling. Now, who's telling the truth? I'm inclined to listen to the storyteller. I'm not going to discount the historian, but he's not telling the whole story. He's telling some of the story. But what about the myth? When families tell their children about their great-grandfathers, do they have to have a grandmothers? Do they have to be absolutely accurate? Or do they catch the spirit of it in the quality of the narrative? See? See what I mean? That's the kicker here. You begin to worship the fact instead of the... the, the you're, you're, you're losing sight of the detail, uh, de of the source of the detail, the wisdom in the detail. You won't get it by just looking at the detail. You have to be able to see the wisdom beyond it, in it, and through it. I don't know how to say that right. See? So now if out of joy in their beauty, namely these things of ours, they thought them gods, let them know how far more excellent is the Lord than these. For the original source of beauty fashioned them. Beauty creates beauty. God, what a great line. For if they were struck by their might and energy, let them for these things realize how much more powerful is he who made them. For from the greatness and the beauty of created things, 
their original author by analogy is seen. Boy, that's very Greek thought here. This is not Jewish thought. This is Greek thought. Yet, for these the blame is less, for they indeed have gone astray, perhaps, though they seek God and wish to find him. Boy, do I agree with that. I'm not blaming anybody if they can't find God, but because they, but I see them as seeking the truth, and as long as they're seeking the truth of the small T, they are actually seeking the truth of the capital T. See, that's the truth. Yeah, they. What does he say? For they search busily among his works, but are distracted by what they see by their philosophical, theological, or uh, uh, scientific methods, because the things seen are fair. Why go beyond it? See? This guy is very, very sensitive. For if they so far succeeded in knowledge that he could speculate about the world, how did they not more quickly find its Lord? And I think probably the reason there was no need to go beyond it. They found it satisfying. There is a spark when you ask the question, why beyond what you know? See, there is a spark that if it doesn't occur... It may only occur maybe at the end of your life when you have time to sum it up. And you see that all that you have done and accomplished and you see that it is fleeting. And you ask, is that all there is? Is that all there is? Remember the song by Peggy Lee? Is that all there is? Is that all there is? If that's all there is, then let us... How did she sing it? Then break out, break out the something and have a ball. Oh, I forgot how she sang it. God, it was a haunting song about 50 years ago. Is that all there is? Is that break out the nun and have a ball? That's all, that's all. God, she was good. Oof. I saw her live 60 years ago. Oh, man. Yeah, is that all there is? It's when you hit that question that the Book of Wisdom comes alive. Is that all there is? As much as what there is is beautiful and enchanting, it's wonderful not taken away from it. I'm not a dualist. I don't want to, can't wait to get to heaven. I love this earth. I love everything about this earth. I love life. Oh, I don't yearning for immortality. I love this one. I see, though, at 80 years old, it's fleetingness as I've buried those in my life, so many in my life who I have loved and been loved by. In its own kind of way, like the ancient, uh, as our uh, Native Americans said, I seek to rejoin my ancestors. I want to be with those whom I have loved and beloved. by. I'm not trying to escape this life. I want it to be rejoined. See? My father taught me that. He taught me. He was the wisest, one of the wisest men I ever knew. Not learned, but wise. He taught me not to ask of life more than it could give, but to savor it. He told me something a long time ago. It was in the 60s, actually, mid-60s. This was a hell of a long time ago. 56 years ago, he said, I have enjoyed my life. Boy, what a true statement. I have enjoyed my life. Because he didn't ask him more of it than he could give. If he was eating a hot dog, he enjoyed the hot dog. If he was eating a lobster, he, ate, he enjoyed the lobster. He, asked not the, he didn't ask the lobster to taste. He didn't ask the hot dog to taste like a lobster. My father was a chef. He could make what he wanted. He savored life. Everything my father did, he seemed to savor. He had a garden that was... The garden in the middle of the inner city. You should see it. And you see the gentle way he touched the flowers. He was a man who revered and loved the earth. He was a man of the earth. I don't think he had any aspirations at all to go to heaven. I think he simply loved life. And he loved it and he nurtured it. He savored it. He felt its sweetness, but he never denied its bitterness as well. My father was a very wise man and was my mother. But my father more articulated it. He articulated to me in a given line here or there to capture it. And that's the essence of wisdom. Sometimes you could say a thing in a line, a single line. But don't ask of life. That, I, that line I learned from the monastery as well. Don't ask of life more than it can give. But savor what it is. So if you're having a cup of coffee, savor the cup of coffee. And don't wish it was a, it was a, a glass of champagne. Okay? Savor it. If you're out fishing, savor the moment. Don't wish you had a bigger boat or a smaller or that. Savor the moment. If you're out in the woods hunting, savor it. Savor the opportunity. Save in the immediacy of its contact. You see? Savor life. Cherish it. See? That's what wisdom is. And my father taught me that. To savor life. 
to enjoy it, not superficially, but with deep meaning and appreciation. Touch the flower with your fingertips. You should see the picture of him doing that. See, waste not, waste not life, live it, live it.